That's brilliant. Okay. So um, a very warm welcome this evening to this Imitative Farmers webinar, where we're looking to introduce a, a new field lab, which is looking at Lucerne and, and how we can graze Lucerne in the UK. Um, we've got two two main speakers uh, this evening who are going to be doing a bit of a double act. But um, just before I introduce them, I just wanted to, to say a few words about Innovative Farmers, for those of you who are a bit newer to the program. Um, I've also got a few words of housekeeping I need to cover. And um, also we've got a bit of a poll just to see um, what experiences people have today in, um, in Lucerne and grazing Lucerne and uh, cutting and using Lucerne as a forage. Um, so my name's Kate, I'm uh, from the Soil Association and work in, on the Innovative Farmers program. Uh, the program is a not-for-profit membership network which is for farmers and growers who are running on-farm trials to enable them to really answer the questions that are really important to them. It was launched back in 2012, uh, mainly back on the idea that sort of um, the best ideas in farming really come from farmers and um, whether that's sort of trying out a new breed or a bit of kit or a different way of responding to changes in climate, um, sort of trialing and testing and hands-on research is really part of many farmers' day job. Um, but often, you know, farmers are doing this alone within the boundaries of their holding and don't necessarily have all the opportunities to share that learning and also to, you know, make full use of that learning by perhaps having some additional research expertise. Um, at the same time, uh, we were sort of learning from researchers that they um, really wanted to be doing more on-farm work and being able to see sort of real impact of their working practice. So um, these two ideas of sort of having research wanting to do more on-farm work, farmers doing research, but perhaps um, not quite as uh, as effectively as they may wish, then brought together this program called Innovative Farmers, bringing these farmers and researchers together so that they can develop on-farm trials and really sort of work together to find practical solutions, um, which are also scientifically robust. So the network and approach is really of particular importance in advancing uh, ecological innovation, particularly as we move, sure, we're moving forward into uh, agroecological farming practice more mainstream really across the UK um, as generally sort of input driven agricultural industries got less to gain from this sort of farming practice so the more we can support farmers to do trials themselves the sort of more rapidly we can advance this sort of type of farming practice so um the on-farm trials we call um, field labs and they can be set up really quickly and are highly practical and it's often about one or two farmers coming up with a question or an idea. The field lab that we're talking about this evening was particularly um, one farmer coming up with, with an idea he wanted to, to sort of take forward and explore with researcher support. We, we can bring in a, a researcher who's got expertise in that topic and they can then help develop what the queer, the clear question is that, that needs to be answered um, can help sort of um, develop what data is needed to collect around that questions to make sure that you know you get some pretty strong science at the end of it and that the farmers really um, finding the answers that they want and that they can you know move forward with that and the, and so really we can support farmers doing um, trials on anything that makes their business more sustainable and more resilient. Those are the sort of two key um, areas we're really wanting to focus on. There's a funding pot to cover any sort of out of pocket expenses, um, equipment materials, uh, support for sort of sampling and testing, um, basically to ensure that there's no real risk associated um, with the trial for the farmer and, and also so that they uh, don't feel sort of out of pocket when they're sharing their experiences. The programme is very active in its dissemination of results and we work really hard to make sure that all the learnings of the field labs are out there amongst the network and out there in the media. So um, we're quite active in doing blogs on social media. There's a regular newsletter and a dedicated website that profiles all the sort of 100 field labs that we've had so far. Um, we've also sort of been quite active in um, 
making short films about the individual field labs, which obviously are quite a digestible way of um, finding out about what's going on in that research. Um, so do go and look at the Imti Farmers website if you haven't already, um, imtifarmers.org, and sign up to the newsletter. I think you've probably been given an opportunity to do that when signing up to this webinar, but if you haven't, or if you've missed that opportunity, then do um, email uh, Kat, who was who would have been the organised email who you had to sign up to the to this webinar this evening. Also, if you've got any topics, any of the farmers out there who've got any topics that you'd be interested in developing a field lab trial about, do please again get in touch with us um, either via CAT or generally via Innovative Farmers website um, and we can see where we can take that. We can see how we can perhaps develop a field lab trial around a question that you want to answer. Right, well, let's get on with the uh, the activity for this evening. So we're going to be hearing about a field lab that's really taking the experiences of extended grazing of Lucerne in New Zealand and um, seeing how well it can work in the UK. I think, um, you know, there's quite good use of Lucerne in uh, forage mixes and also as pure stands, mostly for silage and often generally for dairy um, in the UK with then some aftermath grazing with sheep or cattle. But there, I think we've generally found there's little um, experience of grazing from the spring within the UK. Um, but we've got just an opportunity to uh, poll you all out there now to find out what your experiences are in growing lucerne. So hopefully, um, Kat, can you help us with our poll? So yes, yeah, so if you can answer these quick questions, just so that we can get a bit of an idea of who's out there and who your, what your experience is in growing lucerne. So I think hopefully it's relatively obvious in terms of what to do. So if you're currently grow lucerne, please select yes or no with your mouse. And then are we going to see a result? What happens now? <laughs> <laughs> so, results in. Um, right, 20%, sorry. 20% <laughs> <laughs> of people um, currently grow lucerne, 80% no, but are interested. Excellent. Okay, super. 20% are growing. Brilliant. And so, the next question. So of that 20% who are growing lucerne, are you cutting only, cutting, uh, cutting for silage, obviously, cutting or hay, cutting for and then aftermath grazing or perhaps doing some extended grazing as we're going to be discussing this evening? It looks like it's a straight um, split. Um, third of people cutting, third cutting with aftermath grazing, and the third extended grazing. Ah, okay, brilliant. So there are people out there doing extended grazing. Yeah. Okay. And then I think we had one last question just about what your grazing kind of stock are you grazing with? So dairy cattle, beef cattle, lambs or ewes. Probably lambs and ewes, I'd imagine. So it looks like um, 50% uh, ewes. Uh, only 13% dairy and 30% um, beef or lambs. Okay, so all a bit all over. Okay, mm -hmm. brilliant. 
That's really interesting. Super. Okay. So lots of experience out there and lots of people who want to learn more, which is exactly what it's all about. So I will get on very quickly to um, the speakers. Just a few words of housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So if you submit a question, it will also be recorded and shared. Um, if you've got any questions, please use the question box at the bottom of your control panel or possibly at the side of your control panel. Um, if you've got any technical issues or need any help, then do please send a message to the organisers using the chat box at the bottom. Um, we'll take questions sort of um, after each speaker, although I think they are going to be doing a bit of a sort of shared um, double act. So we'll just sort of look at questions to see if it's a matter of clarification. But then there's a big section for questions at the end, 20 minutes at the end. So there should be plenty of opportunity to um, to get any of your questions answered by the speakers. Um, your microphone's been muted to avoid any feedback. Um, if you want to ask a question then in the question box, but then we can unmute you if you want to explain it more. And also just to say there's a, a red arrow pointing to the, your, the right on your little control panel thing. Um, if you press that, it will remove the control panel out of the way and then you'll be able to see the, the full screen because there's, um, there's videos and photos and things. So you don't necessarily want that to be blocked out of the way. So our two speakers is um, Dave Cross, who's the farmer who sort of kicked this all off um, in terms of wanting to learn more about uh, grazing lucerne on his farm. And uh, also he has a lot of experience of doing this in New Zealand and obviously he wants to look about bringing this back to the UK. So he's going to be talking a lot about that. And then in um, in conversation uh, with Liz Geneva, who uh, is an independent sheep and beef consultant with a uh, keen interest in sort of grazing and forages, particular interest in Lucerne, has indeed written a, a guidebook about it. And she's the coordinator and researcher on this field lab. And she'll be um, explaining a little bit more about the trial and also how you can all get involved in the sort of uh, group around the trial or, or indeed um, the trial is running for two years so you know if you had an opportunity to do some trialing on your farm then um, she's the lady that will be able to speak to about that so um, I am very pleased to hand over to Dave so over to you Dave. Hi, hi everybody thanks very much um, so I guess I'll just kick straight off with a little introduction about the farm. Um, we're thousand acre mixed farm, uh, northwest Norfolk, uh, a couple of miles from the coast. Um, we sublet some land to a free range pig unit, um, sort of a long term plan to try and reduce our granular N usage, um, we grow sugar beet, spring barley, winter barley, wheat, we have some irrigated spuds. Um, I moved back sort of three years ago from managing the farm in New Zealand, uh, got sort of moved away from a more traditional uh, sheep system to uh, outdoor lambing Romneys, we then uh, sort of progressed those to Romney Texels. Um, and then we've sort of had an opportunity given to us um, to be a multiplier flock for a stud, um, all New Zealand genetics. Um, so, yeah. Um, where I was in New Zealand, I was in North Canterbury. Um, Originally, so that would have been 10 years ago after doing a degree um, in ag and business in Wales. Uh, so I went out as a summer student, farm in North Canterbury, uh, what do they average, 23 inches of rain and blowing most of the summer, so you get a lot of evaporation. Um, but they were growing various things, red clover and some lucerne lays and things, um, which was interesting at, at the time, but I didn't learn a huge amount about it. Then I went back um, a year later, there was an opportunity to manage the same farm. So I went back for uh, 18 months to manage that same place. Um, 
and that was at the end of that that was me coming home um so yeah bringing some ideas home from there you know they were sort of outperforming us on growth rates on their lambs when they're getting we're getting another six inches of rain and our evaporation is less than theirs um their growth rates are better their stocking rates were the same and they were using much less granular fertilizer um so it, it's been a slow progression getting there but that was the sort of catalyst to getting us started um so yeah this this slide just here is actually a, a red and white clover lay um so the whole catalyst to getting us going um was my original managing of the farm but then um i we, we sort of came to terms with the fact that we were going to have to change the whole system of the farm so we need to move away from um grass clover mixes more to straight legumes um so i went over four months ago trying to investigate what some different options were um trying to get us ready for having less single farm payment um and just trying to cut out some big chunks of cost out of the business so i mean this even though it's not looser and it's still quite impressive this was the height of summer and that is a sort of dry land grass mix on the left and then a straight red and white clover mix on the right and it was still faring fairly well and they had weaned lambs that were doing sort of 300 350 grams a day on it um and it, it seemed for something that's not particularly well known as for something for being deep rooted um uh, I thought that it was quite impressive. So th there's some different other options other than looser for us to look into, but um, the, the looser was just romping away. So I started in the north of the South Island and was working my way down. Um, this is a video of the farm which I managed, um, showing you that you know if they're getting growth rates that are comparable to ours in conditions that you know we never get like that so my initial sort of thinking was that lucid should be unstoppable really in our conditions compared to theirs um but then i found out moving further south that the sort of the risk period with lucerne is when it's actively growing um so they have large periods of the year where it's slower growing um so it has a higher dry matter um, and is, so there's, there's less issues involved around it. Um, so further down south where it's probably more comparable in climate to ours, um, there was less lucerne grazed and more lucerne cut. Um, but it's, we had, we have an average of about 28 inches, not the averages, it's, it's when they, when it falls. Um, but we have an average of 28 and, and down south where they were moving away from grazing it. Um, I think because their active growth period is most of the summer, spring and autumn. Um, so they're having more issues with it. Um, and they can grow other things like, there's a lot of straight red and white clover grown um so yeah that was the sort of initial layout so we had an opportunity pre my trip to grow some lucerne ourselves uh it was a failed crop of uh plantain chicory and uh fodder rape um so not ideal conditions we drilled it in the middle of the summer and it's come away pretty well um yeah i don't know if we want to go on to our next slide ah yeah so i visited the one of these guys uh and i think the figures kind of speak for themselves really um they were there this particular place is merinos but um it's just completely transformed their business um it's it, it all just starts to come together really being able to get better weights on you lambs 
so you know you, you're getting better production out of your feelings and so on and so on um yeah it's um it, it's it takes some getting a head around because well some of you guys are already doing it but it's a it's a system that you have to embrace rather than uh just a different sward that uh you know change into a multi-species sward or something which you can generally just do your rotational grazing but there's there's all sorts of little issues with lucerne which we'll i'm sure we yet to experience but um yeah i don't know if Liz wants to add anything here i'm appearing hello um so hi i'm liz Geneva. so i'm just going to just quickly talk through this slide as well um so as as dave said these are actually merinos but what i was sort of hoping to illustrate from this slide that i very much stole from derek's presentation from lincoln university um was this it it's um, lucerne's part of the story as dave said so alongside here they've also made significant improvements in terms of youth body condition score they've really focused on lamb survival and then they um, they've also shifted in terms of selection of you. So it's not just there's Dave. Um, it, there's, it's not just it's not just the Lucerne story, but it's how it's fitting together on these systems to sort of drive the performance benefits you see on the slide on the bottom right hand side, which in terms of average lamb weight in dollars per head, um, lamb income, sale weight, and then in terms of value. So it's this sort of accumulative gain really, and Lucerne's part of that story. So, and we'll talk a bit more about Dave's system in, and use in, in a second in terms of how he's also using Lucerne to really push their performance on. Um, oh, I need the news. <laughs> Next slide. I feel very bossy. There we go. Uh, so, as I uh, mentioned before, so when I was still at AHTB a few years ago, myself and a former colleague, Debbie McConnell, um, produced this booklet called Growing and Feeding Lucerne. I sort of hinted at earlier, a lot of the activity that's been doing on Lucerne recently or in the UK is really focused on grazing, sorry, on cutting in recent times. So two or three cuts, maybe four in certain places, and then potentially an aftermath graze, maybe with lambs, maybe with cattle. Uh, there was a bit of a mention of grazing within this booklet, and we took most of that information from NZ. So it's nice to hear that. And there are, Julian, and within this, there's also case studies of people who are grazing Lucerne with um, a range of ruminants. Um, and then the sort of text on the left hand side is really for this particular trial, what are we trying to focus on? What are we trying to get the evidence for? Um, and to help us evaluate actually whether Lucerne is the right thing for Dave to be doing or whether there's something else. And as you mentioned, whether it's high, other high legume swords that may be an advantage. But so this is sort of information that we're collecting as part of the trial. Apart from persistency, actually, because this trial runs for this season and next season. So we'll have an idea in terms of persistency, but we're not actually tracking it for the whole lifetime of that crop. Um, so what we're doing really is that, um, and I'll bring Dave in back in a second, which is there's 101 Romney Cross Texel ewe lambs. They've all been scanned with twins and they're from the first cycle. So they're, they're a tight bunch of sheep with relatively, they've got high energy requirements they're growing as ewe lambs and they're also rearing twins they were around about 52 kilos as a group post topping and they were introduced to lucerne fodder beet and grass uh, from late march and they had been they were on cover crops i think previously so they'd been on forage hadn't they all winter and then had been moved onto this crop then they started lambing mid-april and then the photo you can see um or a video actually in terms of um is around about lambing and those sheep are on about eight hectares and we'll talk about how that's being split up and the variety that has been sown and it was sown last year is Lucelle. So Dave, do you want to just talk up through your U type and what your plans are in terms of your sheep really? Uh, yeah, so there was a sort of combination of a few things that pushed us towards Lucelle. The, the original issue with it was its winter dormancy and trying to get around that, but our neighbour, is moving into trying to sort of improve his soils and is growing a lot of um fodder radish and things like that so well we had we offered us sort of 400 hectares so it's far more than we're going to be able to get, get ourselves through 
so that sorted the winter winter window out um and secondary we needed to improve our well just as a business we needed to improve our land performance figures but because we are going to be recording everything on sil uh, our performance figures are you know directly comparable to everybody else's um and i'm guessing the ram buyer will buy, buy more rams off us if our lamb's performing so um we were we were getting on a, a bit of a slippery slope with the grass where we were having to put more granular in on to try and get performance and uh, a few summer doses of N that sat there for three weeks and then we got three inches of rain and you know lost the benefit of it um found it difficult um putting that fertilizer on when trying to do a decent job with large fields broken down into rotational grazing so loads of electric fences everywhere um yeah so and in term, and you're also you're starting to multiply aren't you in terms of for easy rams as well so that's part of it trying to you're increasing flock yeah. performance but also for increasing sales basically yeah yeah okay so if we move on to the next one so I think hopefully just a quick note we chose we chose the Zell because it's supposed to have a low apical meristem it's supposed to be um yeah, quite tolerant to grazing some of the more cutting layers have quite high growing points so um I think you know that, that that's a theory anyway and it's got reasonable winter dormancy you want a, a, a moderate winter dormancy and it'd be interesting in terms of in, if people are using different varieties in terms of adding it into the chat just we're interested in what varieties are being grown yeah here. absolutely um because there, there's higher performing varieties of lucerne out there and it might be that with our conditions we can just grow one of those you know high yielding ones uh, so this slide here just just illustrates and from a trial perspective what information we're collecting on farm and then you can see by the crosses against the month which is what month is uh, Dave generally is collecting what information so sward height and we'll come on to that a second so uh, sward height is being collected on on that field throughout um, we're also looking at ewe body condition score and weight at a couple of times in the year we're also going to do a, a blood sample of the ewes and also the lambs and that's just because like any legume species it has a very different trace element profile so it's it part of this is not is also clarifying that we're not doing any harm but also trying to track any benefits in terms of from a trace element status perspective we'll also be looking at uh, lamb weights um most important really is those early lamb growth rates so up to about 56 days um and around at weaning so at 90 ish days so that we we focus on that we're looking at fecal egg counts again um, both hoping to find a benefit but in reality just checking that we're not seeing an additional issue on lucerne our advantage is that it is come do you mean it's a recently established sword so it should be relatively clean compared to other um other fields that we're using as control and then we'll so we're doing fecal egg counts both in ewes and lambs throughout that year um and in terms of we're also collating mortality data obviously we're not there's a bit of a concern when everyone starts talking about lucerne is that it is possibly a way to kill stock through a variety of different ways so we're also collecting anything that is um has died on lucerne and, and also in the control groups and trying i'll come on to in trying to get to a to sort of see what could be the cause um we're also looking at soil data and then um, the ambition is that we'll have some field group lab meetings but again we'll talk about that in a bit more detail so you can see this sort of this plan of activity throughout um, the year so from a comparison because it is a trial so we've we've looked at the ewe lambs on the lucerne what we've also got um to make do you mean it's, there's an element of practical but also making sure that it's a good trial design so we have a comparison albeit with mixed age ewes so they're also with twins they're also in the first cycle but obviously they're a different age so we're looking at them on grass and clover we also have a group of ewe lambs they're the later lambing ones on their second cycle on grass and clover so we're using both of those groups to try and counteract the impact of lambing date and also ewe age 
As I mentioned, we're looking at lamb weight, so especially work from AHDB has shown that importance from a commercial farm perspective of tracking performance at eight weeks and around 90 days of weaning, which is 12 to 13 weeks. Um, sorry, 90 days, 12 to 13 weeks. And then we'll also be looking at lamb performance post weaning. The ambition is that those, when we get to weaning, the user removed and the lamb stay with on the lucerne, so they know real nothing apart from lucerne to sort of ensure they don't have any massive change of diet. So the targets that have been established around eight week weights on commercial farms is 20 kilos, and for 90 days is 30 kilos. What we will do um, is to do some element of correction because they're ewe lamb mothers. So gen really rough rule of thumb. So we should sort of drop those targets by kilo if they're shearling groups and we drop them by two kilos for ewe lambs. There's not a huge amount of science behind those drops, but it just makes sure that um, we are recognising that they are also using energy to grow. So it's quite harsh for them to, to be compared directly with mature ewe targets. Um, U weights and body condition school again will be tracked and this is partly to do with weight gain per hectare so not only are we looking at uh, lamb weight gain but we're looking to see how much better those ewes are at putting weight on and condition on and hopefully the benefit of loose end for both of those things. It's every now and again it goes I'm uh, it stops working sorry. Uh, so we've talked a bit about this idea of consistency for consistent forage supply and that's one of the main reasons why Dave is trying it is to try and get something that we know is going to grow constantly through that dry that certainly we can't rely on grass um, in Dave's particular bit of the world to do that during the summertime. So we are looking at pasture cover measurements and because plate meters or um, compressed sword sticks don't really work on lucerne they were developed for grass which swords uh, so the advice from NZ is actually to use a multiplier. So we look at sward height in centimetres and we times it by 90 in the spring. And we times it by 60 in the summer to be able to get our pasture cover measurements. And so that's what we'll do. So at the moment, centimetres are being recorded and then we'll use a multiplier depending on what time of the year it is to get that um, sort of pasture cover estimate. We're also within the project using Farmax, which is a New Zealand software system to build long term scenarios for the for the farmer that's wider than just this lucerne project but it's allowed us to, it will allow us to understand whether actually if dave was to put his 20 percent to his farm to lucerne or 50 percent or what is actually workable as a long-term scenario for that farm or actually it's a little bit of lucerne it may be some red clover so that's what we're sort of trying to build up in terms of scenarios for that so and we'll look at some images in a minute but at the moment seven paddocks have been established within that lucerne that eight hectares with the ambition and again guidance from NZ is coming at sort of 35 to 42 days between grazes so that's why between it a multiple number of paddocks is needed to make sure there's enough for that lucent to have enough of a rest break um, and so yeah and the other thing to say is that the salt and fiber always needs to be available but we have some images to show that oh. So, Dave, do you want to just talk? There's two videos on this screen. So, do you want to just talk through what we're seeing? Uh, yeah. So, the video on the left is just a little overview. You, you, we can't see the. the it's, a, it's a rectangular field, but basically one slightly smaller end. So, I've basically put a fence down the centre uh, and then fenced off the end. So, there's seven paddocks, um, all just over a hectare. Um, it's actually just under eight, he eight hectares because there's a grass buffer strip uh, along the bottom that's fenced in um, quite handily um, to give them a little bit of a back run. Uh, and the video on the right is after three days grazing. Um, this is the first um, first cell, if you want to call it that. Um, and previous to that, I don't think I said that they were set stocked. Um, Two weeks before they started lambing on the fifth, um, they had a back run onto a grass field and a back run onto a fodder bean stubble um, just to try and one give them sort of uh, easy transition and more space to lamb. And so they sort of settled, didn't they? They settled onto that crop, and then so you've re you've recently 
started this rotation. It's only within the last week or so they've been moved on to that the last four yeah. days, five days. Yeah, and, and that was a trend that I saw in New Zealand. Most of the people that were using it as a system, they were landing on their higher ground, which was basically grass and, and, and sub clover and, and, and white clover. Um, and then had loose end paddocks in the bottom of the valley and then it sort of just opened the gates and let sheep drift on. So I think that's quite a good way of um, a steady transition. And, and they didn't really touch the loose end for the first couple of weeks, but they just slowly, gradually got got into it. And, and in terms of, I appreciate you, you've had your hand over some of them in this sort of, you brought some lambs into the into the yards, haven't you, to have a look at them? And you you've seen no sheep having issues or losing condition or having problems on that lucerne? Oh, not not at all. They haven't they haven't scoured. They haven't um, they've held their condition score. They're they're probably growing a little bit too well. Uh, I'm slightly concerned they're going to be huge. <laughs> but <laughs> but okay. their lamb. I mean, I, you I wouldn't want to put single bear and ewe lambs on it. Um, you know, I don't know they're a different class of stock, but um, the lamb sizes have been good. There's been no issues from, you know, slow lambs or anything, no, all, all touch wood, everything's gone well so far. And they were quite a tight group, weren't they, in terms of, there wasn't, they were quite tight in terms of when they lambed over as well. Yeah, so across the whole board, we, um, we've single sire mated and rattled every changing every eight days so we're splitting each cycle um so we put two of the i guess it's one cycle two rattle changes onto here just to get enough numbers i think as if lucerne became a bigger part of the system we would uh because it, it the quicker you can get into the rotation i think the, the better off the plant is um so if if we had more sheep within each eight day group it, it, it would work better but yeah the, you the divide short them up more base, yeah you just split them up yeah. more based on okay um oh i've set them both off now um so in terms of residual so that's uh, again that's your that's your measure in the field they're currently in are they in terms of how high it is which yeah, is just exactly. about 12 centimeters we haven't had enough time to you know graze a few cells down or whatever because it, it's just this last week that they've gone on um so yeah that that's after three days um and i did actually move them today um but you can't see that and so what would you what are you planning to do to get your target residual to so basically the amount that you're taking those sheep out at um i'm doing it to uh sort of digestible leaf that's left they're just picking clean the available leaf without being on there for so long that they're having to eat the new emerging buds. So new emerging buds come around sort of six to seven days and you're seriously depleting the plant's resources if you start eating the emerging buds. So there's a there's a balance. There's a, so you're doing more on sort of plant what the plant is looking like rather than necessarily a finite number. Yeah, and then I'm just going to measure the residual and, and record it because um, it's it's not um, uh, the plant is grazed at different stages. You know, you're going to have woody material gradually working its way further up the plant, so you can't leave the residual to a certain. You know, it, it, it's not sort of grazing by numbers. You you just have to go down to uh, what looks palatable. Uh, and you can do that by folding and snapping the plant. It, well, if it folds, it's the whole thing's digestible and you just don't want to grow out and graze out of the growing point. But if it, if it folds and snaps, that's basically the point that you want to graze it to. And on the screen now, it's just I've put up the sword heights that you measured recently. So the 1st of April was when, as you said, they had access to everything, didn't they? But also access to other crops. So everything was, it was basically what was emerging out of winter, that early spring growth and a light graze and then once you've paddocked up those areas you then measured them again um and yeah. then so that's where your average so that's your average sorry in centimeters i should have said this is centimeters for all your seven paddocks and then also your highest point over those fields 
And again, the NZ advice would be very much going in around about 30 centimetres. So you, you, on quite a lot of those paddocks, you're sort of you're heading towards that target, aren't you, relatively easily? Yeah, I think I think they're saying the start of the rotation around around an average of 30 centimetres. Um, when I went to see uh, Derek Moot, he said that the sort of it, that sort of four three to four inches is okay to start set stocking um, as long as the plant is actively growing. Um, so there's there's a little bit of um, I guess risk involved in that that you know you can with management have sward covers planned for grass to lamb on but because it's winter dormant you're dependent on uh the average spring growth i guess but it, it moved away very fast it was it moved faster than the grass did okay so and so yeah and so as mentioned before we'll be tracking these sward heights about me over the over the course of the project yeah and they vary slightly. Um, one one area was slightly wet in the winter, so it was slower to get going in the spring, but has caught up. And a couple of the others were underneath trees and on top of the hill where they liked camping at night and that sort of thing. So, um, sorry, uh, I moved on the slide too quick. But in terms of you, this is about sort of supplying water and forage. So you've sort of you've manufactured your own. Ver so it's basically a trailable or trailed. Uh, hay rack isn't it but that's attached to your water tank so as you move around as you move your water tank you're also moving your forage to other bits of the field and then using your your sort of quick access point yeah I didn't I didn't want to because there is in such a short period of time I didn't want to have piles of hay everywhere um for the roughage um so it was just trying to keep the field slightly tidy and keep the management easy um so yeah made a little sled trough sits on the sled chain that just hooks straight onto the bike and then a little cable that runs to the hay rack um and then there's an umbilical from that which you just hook on a hook on the hay rack so you don't run over it and then it runs there's a um a little kiwi <laughs> was that an early modification you had to make or not no, <laughs> it wasn't um and then these little uh, Kiwi Tech uh, hydrants where you just push and go with your 25 mil pipe. So you can just leave that main run down the centre of the field, field live uh, and then you just push the umbilical straight into it so it's easy. So I've got two of those hydrants for the field. Yeah. So and then you just also move in, they put them in the corners and then they do multiple fields or oh, small paddocks, sorry. Yeah, so there's like... Um, uh, I've got about 60 meters on the umbilical, so you can put the trough and the hay in the middle of the in the middle of the plot. Um, yeah, so it seems to have, seems to have worked okay so far. And we mentioned salt. So again, have you got is it Himalayan or you just what sort of salt are you We've using? Got, absolutely, they they can't they're tripping over salt. To be fair, there <laughs> there's. Um, mineralized you know uh like rocky salt blocks there's loose mineralized salts and there's himalayan salt um yeah uh, probably uh, i've overdone everything first time around but seeing as there's people watching me i need to do it right okay and there's and they they are taking it as you would expect the salt it's going yeah down, absolutely just, just the, i mean all, all of the sheep have access to, you know, that are on grass and clover have access to Himalayan and um, loose mineralized salts. Um, and they've just eaten it at the same rate. They haven't particularly sought it out. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, I've started that again. Um, so just to continue the trial, so as I mentioned, we're looking at mortality records and so these ideas are just quite simple ones. And the two things that we most associate with lucerne grazing is red gut and bloat. So a lot of it would be um, yes or no. Oh, um, so yeah, we're just, it's not necessarily a full post-mortem. It's just trying to make sure that it's not the mo more common factors. Um, uh, we're also doing some blood samples and we have done, the ULAMs were done earlier and there was no issue in terms of trace elements, but that will be monitored through the programme. But again, not it's to do, it's just to make sure that we're not causing problems, but also hopefully identifying that that 
that loose end is having some advantage. And as I've mentioned, we're also doing fecal egg counts and looking for those differences between forage types. Um, so we were meant to have a meeting on the farm in June, but obviously for other reasons, uh, it might not be happening or it won't be happening. So we associate with this field lab, we do have a discussion group and the plan is, so once we've got the information from the early weights and also weaning, then we'll have another online meeting similar to this, um, but probably hopefully with Dave in the, once we've practiced, once Dave in the, in the field with videos, um, looking at the crop really to see how it's performing that few months into that grazing system. The other thing to remember is, yes, we don't have the opportunity to go and see it this season or maybe later this season, but it, this field lab does run for another year. So hopefully next year we'll have a chance to go and have a look and we'll obviously have more data to talk about. If you are interested, we've got a few sort of original members of that discussion group, but if you are interested in joining, um, please send me an email. So my email address is liz at lizgeneva.com. I can also be found at Twitter, on Twitter. So um, that sort of lends itself to sort of questions really. So I'll hand back to Kate and I apologise for my slide movement issues. Thank, thanks very much, Liz. And Dave, that's brilliant. It's, it's worked really well hearing you in conversation all about this trial. So that's, that's really great. Um, do people, if you've got further questions about the trial, um, do you write in the, the chat box and we'll be able to answer. If, you, if you're, um, you know, Grazing Lucerne at the moment, as we say, you know, what varieties are you using, what activity um, are you doing, what sort of risks or problems you might have had that you want um, any sort of comments or feedback on, then um, then do then do get in touch. Um, there is um, one question for Dave regarding um, growing a bigger area of Lucerne. From the experiences you've had so far, will you be looking to to sow more? Are you feeling feeling oh. good? You feeling confident? I mean, it looks good so far. Um, it, it's a little bit early to say. Um, there's a few, there's potential issues with aphids, um, which would be interesting to see whether that comes to light or not. And um, yeah, just just the practicalities of running the whole thing. I mean, we we, we won't be able to use it as, um, you know, as solely for, our grazing platform but we could definitely have a higher proportion you 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 generally want to grow on south facing slopes that, that are prone to drought um we're a valley here and so that knocks out 50 percent of the farm um but it might be an idea to grow say enough that we could wean all of our new lambs onto it and have dependable growth so we're not having to grow say summer brassica crops or something um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll tell, I guess. And that some some of the scenarios we'll be building with Farmax would also help. It won't necessarily tell us the answer, but it will give us some ideas to sort of talk about. Also, rotationally, it's tricky because it's down. The idea is of, of the legumes that we're trying to rotate them around and utilise the nitrogen that we're fixing. Um, and because it's four or five year lays potentially. It's quite tricky to rotate around, so I think there's going to be a combination of lucerne and maybe red and white clover mixes. Okay, that's great. I understand there's another question, but I can't see the question box, so hopefully Kat can answer it. Hello, Ethan here. Um, Ian's asked, uh, he said he might have missed it, but any indications on stocking rate and dry matter production? So in terms of the moment, oh, yeah. we've got 101 ewe lambs on just under seven hectares. So that's, my maths is terrible, but looking at 11 and a bit ewes per, he yeah, per hectare. Is that right? No, it's more than that. 100 divided Eight by divided seven by and a bit. My so brain's gone, sorry. <laughs> I think it was dividing the wrong number by the wrong number. That doesn't 12, 13, 13 ewes basically, 13 ewe lambs per hectare. Great, thank you. I hope that helps, Ian. Um, Peter Platter says, Have you considered other legumes like samphoin? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, I'm quite intrigued. Um, there's a guy in Canada that um, is drilling samphoin and lucerne together. Um, 
we have to drill it in alternative rows uh and he is you grazing cattle on that um 30 apparently he's saying if you can grow um 30 percent of the dry matter available sample and you eliminate any bloat risk because of the um the tannins that uh, the sandfoin produces uh but sandfoin isn't quite as long living as lucerne so yeah i don't know it'd be a good one to experiment with especially as now we've got access to a to a drill that could drill turn cultures okay thank you um sounds like kevin's on very different land but um he says did you have any problems getting the lucerne to establish and how did you do it? He's in Northern Ireland um, and has quite wet, naturally acidic soils. Didn't establish in the first year. Um, and if it does, it doesn't last. Doesn't sound like a good spot for Lucid. <laughs> um, we are we're very high pH. You can't have wet winters. It will tolerate wet, but it doesn't, you know, um, it's much slower to get going. It stresses it out that if the water table comes up, so does the uh the the root growth so the, the the water table essentially cuts off the root growth so then the plant has to put its spring resources into growing root again um so you you really want free draining soil through the winter as well um yeah you'd have to pile lime on and hope that it stops raining in the winter i guess um but yeah so how we established it we um Tirano, uh horse Tirano did um and then rolled it cambridge rolled it uh to get the even seed bed uh and then drilled it with the bird of star uh rapid um and then rolled it twice it likes a nice it likes a hard seed bed and it, it was in cereals before wasn't it so it came out of a in out of a cereal came, seed bed it came out of a I'm going to ask you something now i think it came out of sugar beet um and then we put it into a grazing lay which failed um the pigeons ate out the fodder rape uh and the chicory didn't do particularly well so it was sort of and we were toying with the idea of lucerne at the time so it was sort of an opportunity to just jump into it and then i learned about it afterwards right um, and just to go back to that point in terms of it could be that something like a well all of those legumes are really like good ph so we're talking sort of six to six point two so it is going to be always a challenge on that and i in terms of from dave's point which is lucerne is particularly likes a lot of calcium so that's why yeah. it's cheaper to grow on high ph soils because if you're on low ph soils you just have to keep adding a lot of calcium in um it's not so, a goal really i don't think because the the, 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 the root is going to go you know deeper into into your soils that you can't affect you know but i think but potentially a red clover type crop could be more useful do you mean if you want if you want to grow more protein red clover might yeah, be more tolerant to those things like that that like acidic soils okay we got um, any other questions Kat? yeah a couple more uh david asked whether we can have more information on feeding of forage does intake vary daily and do you think it would be higher if we had more rain i think the intake of the forage would be higher or the growth um at the moment moisture isn't affecting its growth even though we've had a really dry spring I mean, it's it's down deeper than the moisture is going to affect it for the whole summer, I think, already. Um, uh, I don't, I, as to intake, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, you would, you mean, we're still basing it on an allocation. So for use, we're looking at two and a half to three percent of their body weight, probably as allocation like other legumes because of their high throughput through the room and they'll actually probably be able to take more in their intakes will be a bit higher because it's just it flows out the room and quicker um and it's very digestible yeah 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 the challenge is are we collecting that we'll sort of have an idea in terms of how long they've been on a paddock what it started up what it ended at so we can have an, an estimate of what they've what they've utilized My feeling at the beginning is 
my feeling at the beginning is we don't have enough sheep on the system at the minute. I think we're going to have to end up trying to somehow transition some more ewes and lambs onto it. Um, I think it's going to beat us. It was beating us when we were set to stop it. So, um, and it doesn't like that. Um, so we'll we'll see. And in terms of uh, you would expect dry intakes to go down in wet conditions because it's just it's basically like eating soup versus Mars bars. It's easier for them to take it in if it's drier. Yeah. And, and like I said before, you know, if you I don't think we'll have too much of this issue, but if you've got a period of time where the plant is actually getting drought stress and growing slower um, and then you get um, a big dose of rain, the nitrogen content of the lucerne plant is quite high and then you can get some bigger problems so there's other things you can do around that so um like uh, mowing a third of the crop and letting it wilt um yeah there's there's, there's lots of different sort of things to get your head around but you know um you then you need to let it wilt for three days but then you're in sort of period of time when it's going to start regrowing so yeah it's all just trying to balance up the best options Okay, thank you. Um, and the um, all important one from Ryan at Farmers Weekly, when will we have some results? <laughs> so um, we'll be discussing some early results in July. So at that July meeting we talked about, so similar meeting to this, but... Because we'll we'll yeah. you'll have all the lamb data then, won't you? Or the first lot of lamb data. Yeah, I mean, uh, it won't be long until we can take six week weights, uh, and then we'll have weaning weights. Um, and new condition scores at weaning um, and then it will get interesting once we're into August and everything else is stopping growing um, and, and whether we're going to have to pile more lambs on it and everything else that yeah I mean we're with five weeks into having sheep on it so yeah it's very early days yeah yeah sure just one more come in actually um uh, is it possible to grow lucerne organically? Uh, I can't see why not. Um, especially, it, I'm, I'm not completely up to speed with what you can and can't use. But um, previous to the lucerne being drilled, we established the previous crop with biosolids, so to sort out the P and K for the first couple of years. Um, I think you can use biosolids um, and you've got the benefit of a winter dormant period uh, to put more of that on potentially, let it break down so you don't have contamination from when it's actually growing. Um, and I mean, it's and in terms of sprays, of there are some options, aren't there, Dave, but there's not a huge number of sprays you'd be using anyway on it. Well, we, we sprayed ours uh, at three true leaves before TB, which we're losing this year. Um, once Lucerne's established, it actually, uh, you know, I can't remember what the proper term for it is, but um, it inhibits uh, other plants growing once it's actually established. You can't actually top up a Lucerne sword with Lucerne. Um, it, so once it's established and the sheep graze out the annual weeds, which they seem to be doing quite well, um, it, I don't think it's going to be a problem. It's if you deplete the plant and then you give, um, you know, grass species a chance to uh, compete with it. But if you're rotationally grazing it, it can't, nothing else can compete with it, I don't think. Yeah. Smothers everything. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Sorry. I certainly know plenty of organic farmers who are growing it sort of in mixes for silage and things, you know, quite successfully. Um, but as you say, I think I it's think all about the competition. Something it? In the, there's some, definitely something in it, 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 whether it was drilling your, it could be drilling your headlands with sandfoin or something. I think there's there could be something in that because it's, it's the natural worm in itself. It's, it's just whether you can make the whole system work from having two different growth patterns. Sure. Apparently the, the <laughs> apparently the word is autotoxicity. Um, ben yes. says that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think that's all the questions for now, unless anyone Is else wants to ask questions? any. That's be very good timing if it is. I mean, obviously, um, if you do have further questions or if you want to, you know, know anything further about the trial, then, um, you know, do contact Liz directly or contact ourselves at um, Imitative Farmers um, via CAT or via the website and we'll be able to help explain more about um, any more about the trial. And um, and do obviously get in touch once as soon as we've got the, um, the meeting planned for July and depending on... The situation, uh, but I imagine it will probably end up being a, a remote meeting again, but hopefully we'll be able to have um, Dave on the farm and we'll be able to sort of be more interactive in terms of some video and things. But thank you ever so much for joining us all this evening. And if, yeah, if you want to get more involved, get in contact with Liz, get in contact with us and, um, and we'll be able to deliver more results in, in a few months time. So, um, Thank you very and thank you ever so much to Dave and Liz, obviously, for uh, all your lovely discussion and information. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See yeah. ya.